Rosemary Terenzio is the New York Times best-selling author of Fairy Tale Interrupted, a memoir of life, love and loss. Rosie now works as a PR consultant and strategic communications expert, but between the years of 1994 and until his death in 1999, she was JFK Jr.'s Chief of Staff. I feel incredibly privileged that Rosie allowed me to interview her on what it was like to be looking after one of the world's living legends during that time when he launched George, which was such a unique concept out there in the market, and how you deal with the death of somebody that you are so incredibly fond of, but who also is such public property. It was a real honour to interview Rosie, and I hope that you get as much from the interview as I did from interviewing her. Hi Rosie, thank you so much for agreeing to join us to t um, raise some money for Vicky Soak Elevens this afternoon. Hi Lucy, thank you for having me. Anything for Vicky, you know that. Of course. Um, we're just so delighted to have you here because your story is so, so unique. And um, obviously you wrote the amazing book, Fairy Tale Interrupted, which a lot of the people who are looking this afternoon will know about. But for those that don't, could you start off just by giving us a little bit of background information about you and where you come from and, um, you know, uh, how you came to go and work for JFK Jr. at George? Yeah, I think that's the, probably the question that I've always been asked first is, and the most popular question is, how did you get that job? And I came from New York. I grew up in New York City in the Bronx, outside of Manhattan, and I was uh, working at a PR firm. It was probably my first job, I think, out of college, and I was working for this boutique PR firm in the city and doing all sorts of fun things. And John started to come into the office, and I had no idea why he was there. I just thought, okay, there he was friends with my boss, Michael Berman. They served on a charity board together, and I assumed it had something to do with that. Little did I know, Michael was in the process of selling the PR firm and starting George Magazine. So that is how, so once they started to sort of have this collaboration and see if they could make a go of it, uh, Michael did decide to sell the PR firm and start George with John, and I panicked because I thought, I'm losing my job. Like, I'm, I'm going to lose my job, and I loved my job, and I loved working for Michael. Um, and as it turned out, as we all know, um, I got a much better job <laughs> working for JFK Jr. So did he start talking to you when he came in and decide that he wanted you to work for him? Not at all. Not at all. I was furious that he had taken over my office and I couldn't understand why I was getting thrown out of my office. I, again, initially I didn't know that they were starting George and I think I said to him, why do you need an office anyway? You don't even have a job. So it, you know, it was a rocky start. It was a rocky start, but we got past it. And uh, I think he, he was amused and a little shocked that anyone would speak to him that way. I suspect that was probably the basis of your relationship being so good from the beginning. Well, and also so playful, but also so torturously teasing, because that now he had an intro and he could tease me about anything and everything. My hair, my voice, what are you doing? Why are you wearing that? Why are you doing this? You know, he was he was a big tease. He was like an older brother, and it was it was really fun. You could and I teased him but... right back. Sorry, Rosie, you couldn't have been from more, from more different backgrounds. No, we were, I, I mean, John grew up on Fifth Avenue across the street from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I grew up in the Bronx with, you know, three sisters, my mom, my great-grandmother, my grandmother, and one bathroom. Very different. <laughs> Very different. So how long did you actually work for him? You know, I think that what, the way that we came together was that we realized that our similarities were much more in line than our differences. And one of the things that I think John prized was ultimately loyalty. And, and I grew up in a family that was very much about loyalty and, and family and relationships and people and, you know, being, being true and real. 
And I think John really valued that. And that was sort of the bedrock, the basis of our relationship. I didn't want anything from him other than a job. And I think that was unusual in his in his world. Absolutely. So you were there working with him in the run up to the launch of George over quite a long period of time, weren't you? Uh, no, I was there probably five or six months when we launched George. And then it was it was party on. There we go. I think I, I hadn't had a day off in three months when we launched. Oh, my word. Maybe that's why I felt like it was a long period of time, because reading the book, it felt like so much was crammed into that space. But that makes sense if it was yeah. no day off for three months. Yeah. And it was, but it was so amazing and fun. And, you know, you just didn't want to miss anything because it was new and it was exciting. It was geared toward a young audience. There were all young people in the office and it, it was the best place to be. How many of you were working there at that time? Initially, there were about, I would say, 12 of us, maybe. And then we grew to about a 40-person staff. Yeah. And what did a normal day look like to you? A constant flux of chaos. <laughs> the <laughs> phone was ringing off the hook. The mail was, there was, there was this huge um, bucket, uh, sort of a square plastic white bucket that said U.S. Postal Service on it. And it was full to the brim. And there were usually one or two of them probably twice or three times a day that I had to sort through. And it was all just for him. It wasn't George Magazine's mail. It was John's mail. Oh, my word. And I suspect the telephone calls were quite um, frenetic, too. Phone rang incessantly, Lucy. I, I, it never stopped. I mean, I would hear it in my sleep. And John would say the same thing. He's like, God, I hear that phone ringing in my sleep. So how do you fit other work around doing that amount of mail and that amount of phone calls? You know, you multitask like most executive assistants and personal assistants do. You, 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 you're reading a letter while you're taking down a voicemail, phone num a phone number from a voicemail, and you're, you're scribbling notes on something else, and then you open the next letter, and you, know, you just keep going until it all gets done. And it doesn't ever all gets done, so you just start again the next day. <laughs> Sounds really exciting, though. It was. It was. It was a thrill. It was a great. It was a joy ride. And and I think the way you know the way that you sort of get things done is to I I, I find that when I'm busier I get more done. Mm. I, I the more the more I have to do the more I get done. I um know that he was very specific about what he wanted to you to say to people when they telephoned if he wasn't available. Yeah, John never wanted you to say he was out of town if he wasn't or, you know, well, first of all, you couldn't do that because I did do that once. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, he's going to be out of town. And his photograph was in the paper the next day. So they were just like, no, he wasn't out of town. So I learned that lesson pretty quickly, which was don't, basically don't lie. I mean, don't lie. Don't lie to the media. Don't, don't, you know, you can just say he's not going to be able to make it, but you don't have to, you don't have to kind of go further than that. It must be really daunting managing the brand of a living legend like that. It is. It was, you know, initially it was very difficult because I didn't know if it was mine to manage, you know. Um, I didn't know if I had a right to do that. But I think when you really care about someone and it's your mentor and it's the person that you look up to and look up to still so much you know it, it, it's your duty to sort of make sure that he's not forgotten and I think if John knew he were going to be gone at 38 years old he would not want to be forgotten and I am determined that he not be forgotten absolutely um so tell me about when it actually launched oh my gosh the launch was insane we um we decided to do the press conference at, down at Federal Hall um, in Manhattan near uh, Wall Street. And um, I believe it was the site of George Washington's first speech. Um, and we, there were television cameras and still cameras. And it, 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 it was complete media chaos, ordered chaos, but chaos. And, uh, you know, some of us weren't sure whether, 
that couldn't be for us. That couldn't be for George. No way. And then we walked in and we realized, yeah, there was something like 300 still photographers in one room. Oh, my word. How do you manage that? Uh, very carefully. <laughs> You know, we just, you know, we got, we made sure everyone had a press pass. We literally went through every single name and media outlet on the list to make sure that those were the people that we wanted in the room because, you know, we wanted it to be orderly and kind of serious but kind of fun and, and interesting for people and give them an opportunity to ask John questions that would then propel them to be interested in, in, in buying the magazine and in reading the magazine. I know that you have a story that you tell sometimes when you're um, on tour about him showing other people the magazine first. Would you, uh, yeah, would you share that with us? So I had been working for three months without a day off and the magazine, you know, the launch was, was, was frenetic and chaotic and, and all of that, but the anticipation was just so exciting. It was just so overwhelming uh, waiting for that first issue to finally come to the office and I was sitting outside at my desk and the entire staff which I said was about probably about 15 at that time walked into his office and the door closed and everyone came out sort of laughing and giggling and oh my god this is so great and congratulating each other and I just looked up and said what's going on and they said oh we got the first issue did you not see it and I was, I was so devastated because I, I just felt like I'd been there from day one. I'd worked so hard and to show everyone else the magazine and not ask me to come in at least or, or give me a peek first was, was really, it just, I, it just made me feel really bad. And, and I let him know it. And his reaction actually shocked me because initially he, I think he just felt, I think he felt really bad, but he didn't know how to process it. So he sort of kind of blew up, which was not like John and said, look, too bad, basically, that's life. And if you're going to be that upset about it, then maybe you should go home for the day. And I was flabbergasted. And um, I kept my head down and I did my work and the next morning I came in and he called me into his office first thing and he said, could you shut the door and thought for sure this was it. I'm going to be working at Starbucks, but that's okay. I like Starbucks. <laughs> and he was so great. He sat me down and he said, you know what? You were right. I'm really sorry. I apologize. I should have brought you in and I should have showed you the magazine first because you really have worked so hard and you know, it, it wasn't fair of me. So, here you go. And we went through every page and it was awesome. And he just, we looked at every story and we critiqued it and we laughed and it was amazing. On the other hand, him handling that so badly, I know there's another story about him taking you to lunch, which shows what an absolute gentleman he was. Yes. I initially, the staff was very standoffish with me. I, you know, I wasn't like them. I wasn't from the same world that they were from. They were all, you know, sort of Ivy League educated, sophisticated writers, editors, magazine people, and I wasn't. I was, to them, I was, you know, the secretary from the outer borough, which, which if you know anything about New York, uh, there's a stigma to that. And, and I think that they, they really kind of stereotyped me and initially, and they were all going out to lunch for someone's birthday and the entire staff, so there were, I guess, 14 out of the 15, I was not invited. And so he came out and everyone was gone and he said, oh, you could have gone to lunch with them, Rosie. I, you know, I, I, I could manage for, you know, an hour or so. And I said, oh no, it's okay. I said, and he said, why? I said, I wasn't invited. He sort of like, you weren't invited? I said, no. And he said, why? I said, I have no idea, John. I just, I don't generally get invited with them. And I think, you know, it's fine. Don't worry about it. No, 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 no. He said, get your things. And he said, where did they go? Before that, obviously. He said, where'd they go? I said, oh, they went to, and I named the restaurant, the grill next door. 
He said, okay, get your things. We're going to lunch. And I said, okay. So we walked into the grill and we sat in the middle of the restaurant, just the two of us. And I think the entire staff was flabbergasted. How wonderful. <laughs> it was really sweet. It was sweet. It was, it was a really sweet gesture on his part. You know, and I think that's just who he was as a person. He always went for the quietest person in the room. He always went for the person that seemed uneasy or nervous to put them at ease first. And, and he was a real gentleman. He was, he was a really, his manners were impeccable. What would you say were the biggest challenges of working with him? Well, I think some of the biggest challenges obviously were the media and that, and that's, you know, learning how to navigate a, a world where everybody wants John and everybody meaning the media, every media outlet is looking for something, a photograph, an interview, a, a quote, what's the next cover of George going to be? Who is he dating? Is he with Carolyn? Is he getting married? And so, it, navigating the requests, but then also dealing with the not so true stories that are out there and really figuring out which ones you respond to and which ones you don't. And, and he taught me a lot about that. And I think that's where my love kind of for the media came from because I learned so much from him how to navigate all of that. And, and it became my next profession. Were you involved with organizing the wedding? Oh, yes. <laughs> I remember they were asking me, where should we go? Where should we get married? Where's quiet? Where's, you know, off the beaten path? And I, I sent them, I said, you know, I heard Nova Scotia is beautiful. You should go to Nova Scotia. No one would ever think you'd go there. You should go there and get married. And uh, Carolyn said, okay. And they planned a trip to Nova Scotia. And I think it was in, I want to say November, which is probably not the best time. And she called me from there and she said, this place is really cold and really dreary and I don't know what you were thinking, but we're coming home tomorrow. <laughs> so Nova Scotia it was not, but um, they ended up getting married on an, on a, on an island off of uh, the state of Georgia called Cumberland Island. And there's only one little tiny um, Baptist church uh, and one inn, it's called the Grayfield Inn, and wild horses roam on the beach, and it's an amazing, amazing place. How beautiful. It was, and there were only 30 people at their wedding. Were you one of them? I was not. I stayed behind to deal with the onslaught of media. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to take the friends out to brunch who would find out on Sunday that they were not invited either. <laughs> Okay, so you were very good friends with both of them, I understand. So that must be have been quite difficult to juggle the relationship with both of them, I would have thought. Yeah, it could be. I mean, you really, I really had to have, it was difficult to establish boundaries. Uh, I would say it was difficult. I would say you have to establish those boundaries and you have to understand that you work for your executive and that's where your loyalty has to be. Um, so it, it, it was important to separate the personal and the professional. And it was John who really helped me to navigate that. And I felt, I always felt I could be honest with him about, you know, the line between the friendship with Carolyn and working for him. And, and he was, he was open to that. Rosie, tell me about a real career highlight. Tell me about something that when you look back on it, you think, Wow, that was just pinch me. Well, there are a few, but I'll give you the one that I think was the real career highlight was being invited to the White House Correspondents' Dinner, which is where all of the media that covers the White House, foreign, domestic, all of them, in one room to sort of celebrate the president. And it was, I was invited and it was sort of like the, it was like the Oscars um, in, in Washington, D.C. And it was amazing because the president was there and every media person in the world was there and Aretha Franklin sang. And it was just one of those nights where you're like, how, and you're, I'm sitting next to Sean Penn and Claire Danes and 
the presidents on the dais with the first lady. And it, it was just this amazing, amazing night. Oh, sounds perfect. Yeah. Um, it was, Can I it was possibly incredible. Um, get you to tell me about a time where it went horribly wrong and how you dealt with that? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> there was this one time when, uh, well, I'll give you one where it went horribly right and one where, when it went horribly wrong. And the one where it went horribly wrong was I had misspelled the name of an editor that John was writing to. Um, to write something for the magazine, and that editor gave the note with his name misspelled to a tabloid newspaper here in New York, and it was everywhere the next day that, obviously, that John had misspelled his name. So I was humiliated, um, and I came in the next morning with the newspaper, and I said, oh my god, I'm, uh, this is humiliating. And he said, oh really? It's humiliating for you? What about me? <laughs> I failed the bar twice. How do you think I feel? Um, but it, so it was. It was definitely a humbling experience. Um, and then where it went horribly right was we were trying to get Princess Diana to agree to be on the cover and to have John interview her for George. And we had to go to her. Obviously, she was staying at a hotel here in New York, and I knew. I just knew that somebody was going. To leak that they were meeting because it, there were too many it, on our side it was just me but on her side there were just too many people involved and I thought somehow it's gonna get out there whether it was the hotel or just somehow it just seemed like once there were too many people in the mix it would get out and so I said we should go right through the front door and he said no way no way he said I should wear some kind of a disguise I should put something on, I should cover my head. I'm like, no, we're just going to walk right through the front door because if you go through the side door, that's where they think you're going to go and there's going to be a barrage of press there. And sure enough, we walked right through the front door of the Carlisle Hotel and there was not one soul <laughs> outside and not one press person in the lobby. And he went right upstairs, did his meeting. How extraordinary. And did she agree to go on the front cover? She didn't. She said, um, she wrote a note after saying, um, you know, I'm sorry, but right now I'm not really, uh, I'm not right now, but perhaps down the road. And she did say something that was heartbreaking in the note. She said, I hope the paparazzi are leaving you alone. Yes. Awful. Yeah, it was. Um, can we change tack, tack very slightly, Rosemary? Um, sure. Tell me what you think makes an exceptional assistant. I think an exceptional assistant is a great listener and understands that knowing what her executive or his executive wants, you, you sorry, I want to go back there. Um, what makes an exceptional assistant is so, uh, an assistant who can listen to what their executive is looking for. What does an executive need to do their job that you can provide for them? And I think that that is the most important thing about being a PA or an EA. So translating, really? Yeah, I mean, and translating by observing and listening because they generally, most executives are too busy to sit you down and tell you what they want and what they need and what, you know, there are certain things that you'll you'll have protocols for, but a lot of what you are going to have to do for an executive is going to be on instinct and what you see them, how you see them doing their job and how you see them living their lives as well, because you're part of both. Hmm. What are the most important lessons that you learned from working with JFK Jr.? I think one of the most important things about an executive is how they treat the people around them. And you can learn a lot about an executive by how they treat the people around them and who they have around them, who they listen to, who they seek counsel from, um, who they bring into their circle and who they don't bring into their circle, I think is very important for an EA to observe. You can learn an awful lot that way about an executive. 
we already talked about the number of hours you were doing in um, the first three months and the fact you didn't have a day off for three months. And we've also talked about the fact you have this massive family. How did you juggle your personal life and your work life? I was constantly running back and forth and I was always late for every family function. I was always late. My family would just, they were exasperated. I mean, in, in, initially they sort of understood, but I, after a while it was kind of like, oh, come on, it's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day. He contacted you on Christmas Day. He called me at my mom's and we were just, had just sat down to Christmas dinner and he called and he said, uh, I need your help. I, I'm so sorry, but I need to change my flight. Um, and my mom in the background said, doesn't he realize it's Christmas Day? And I thought, oh, God. And he said, oh, Mom's not a big fan of me today. <laughs> I said, no, she's not. Not at all. <laughs> but, you know, that was part of the job. So, Rosie, it's a difficult conversation to have, but um, can you tell us a bit about the night that he died? Because I know that you were staying in his apartment that night, weren't you? Yes. I That, that was a Friday, and I had left. I was leaving early to go, you know, because it was a Friday. It was hot. It was you know, the summer, and I had asked him if I could leave a bit earlier. He was taking off, obviously, for the weekend, and my air conditioning had gone out. And he said, you can't stay in your apartment. It's too hot. It was something like 98 degrees and humid in New York City. So you know what that can be like. And he said, just stay at our place because we're not going to be there. Um, and then, you know, you can sort it out on Monday when we get back. And I said, okay. So I went and I stayed. Um, I had gone out with some friends for drinks, came back home. And I was getting the, I was on the phone talking about the cover that we were shooting the next day in LA. We were shooting Rob Lowe for the cover the next day. That was John's final cover. And there was a certain way that he wanted it shot. And I was talking to our art director about that. And the, the other line kept ringing. They had another phone on the other side of the apartment. And it was strange because only a few people, family members, had that number. And I ran down and I answered it. And it was Carol Radziwill. And she said, she thought I was Carolyn. And she said, oh, thank goodness you're there. And I said, Carol, this is Rose. Um, what's going on? And she said, they haven't arrived in Martha's Vineyard. And I said, oh, I think they were going to Hyannis first. And she said, well, they haven't arrived in Hyannis either. So she said, I've called the Coast Guard. And I thought, oh, God, please tell me you did not alert the authorities. Because I, not in a million years, Lucy, did I think that plane was gone. No way. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if this gets out, and then he's coming, he's going to call me in an hour and say, why did you let this get so crazy? You know, everything's fine. And Carol, we, we just went on and on for hours. I mean, at this point, it was probably 3 a.m. And I called the airport to find out if the plane had, in fact, taken off. And they said that the gentleman who was there was obviously home asleep. And I said, you need to wake him up. So they did. And he said that the plane took off at 8.39. I'll never forget that. And I thought... Well, if that plane took off and it's not landed, we have a huge problem. And I called Senator Kennedy and I woke him up at 3.30 in the morning and said, Senator, you, you have to do something. The plane took off at 8.39 and he just said, okay, stay there. I'll call you back. And, and, and that just went haywire from there. It was just endless, endless phone calls and, and trying to verify, you know, where it could have gone. Did it land somewhere else? When was the last contact with it? And that's when the senator called the White House and basically said, you have to get out. We have to get out in the water and find them. I mean, the senator knew. I was still in denial, but the senator knew. And then I think it was two days later, his office had called me, I was still at John's house and said, we are switching our mission from search and rescue to search and recovery. And I said, what does that mean? And she paused. And she said, it means that we don't expect to find them alive. And I was just gutted, devastated. 
yes. and terrified. I mean, just terrified. You know, everything was was just gone, literally gone, in 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 one night. How quickly did the press get hold of it? Pretty quickly, because they all have scanners and they have, um, you know, so they listen to police radio and they listen to the transmissions with the Coast Guard, especially in the middle of the summer. They're always, the Coast Guard is always, you know, dealing with some sort of rescue or some sort of accident or something on the water, especially in that area. So they, they're on their radios quite frequently. So it was picked up pretty quickly. And I remember turning on the TV about, I think it was about five o'clock in the morning. And I just saw this helicopter hovering over the ocean. And it was just this constant, I'll never forget it. It was just this one helicopter just constantly hovering over this ocean. And it was just nothing. It was just the ocean. So difficult for you trying to deal with that whole situation, but also trying to deal with your grief. I, I definitely had a delayed reaction to all of it and a delayed grieving process, you know, because the initial... You know, the initial first six months was making sure that, you know, hit, that Caroline was getting what she needed, that Caroline's mother, I was helping her, closing up the apartment, selling the apartment, you know, closing up the office at George, getting all of his belongings where they needed to be. I mean, Lucy, there were things on his office wall, like, you know, a portrait of each president with their original signature up until his father that his mother was given from the White House. The flag that John Glenn had put on the moon was brought back and given to his mother, and it was in a frame. I mean, you can't go out and just buy a new, you know, the flag the guy put on the moon the first time. <laughs> you don't come across those very often. So it was it, there was a lot of a lot of a lot of stuff to do at once. So once I started my PR firm, I gravitated toward crisis management because I thought, well, bring it. I mean, I've there's nothing you can't throw at me at this point. Yeah, so you've it, done that at the highest level. Certainly, yeah. And, and I remember when I first wanted to get into crisis management, and I said to a friend of mine, I've never, never really done crisis before, though. And she looked at me and she said, excuse me? And I thought, oh, that. <laughs> That's so funny. You know, we, and I think, I, I think it's, it's, it's an example. It's an assistant thing, but it's also, I believe, a female thing in that as women, we sort of tend to downplay all that we do and we do so much and we can we can just turn on a dime and, and, and turn it around and get it right and get it done and learn something new. And, and I think with men, they are almost conditioned to really type that about themselves and believe that about themselves and... and so, I, so I think in, as EAs and PAs, I, I, I wonder if, if in that role as well, you know, men are a bit more, you know, puffed up and confident than women are. Yeah, I don't suspect that you ever expected to be in a position where you were having to put all that stuff in place and managing his brand after he died. Um, it must have been really quite difficult going for other roles. Is that why you started the PR company? It was it was very difficult. It was it was comical as well as difficult, but it was it was it was difficult to imagine working for someone else. It, it, I could not imagine who else would I work for. Because John was a different kind of celebrity. I mean, he was actually John was George magazine. He was celebrity, pop culture, and politics all wrapped into one. And to find that, there was no other John F. Kennedy Jr. in America, and there never will be again. You know, they were our royalty, so to speak, and, and, and there won't, you know, there won't be another. So it was very difficult to go and try to match that or, or find a comparative place to work, person to work for. There, um, with your book, Fairy Tale Interrupted, there must have been so much that you could have put into that. How did you choose which bits you were going to put in and which bits you were going to leave out? You know, I had a great editor, I'll be honest. I, I wrote 
a lot. And then I went literally went through my book line by line with my editor. And and anything that just didn't sound authentic, if it didn't sound like me talking, if it didn't sound like him having a conversation with me or me having a conversation with him, like I would in a room every day, I I didn't I took it out. Or even going back and forth with my mom. If it didn't sound like my mom and I speaking you know, if it didn't sound like my mom and me having a conversation at our kitchen table, it was out. <laughs> so what happens now? I mean, you're, you're, I know that you um, started your own PR company. Um, that's been bought out, am I right? And you're now working for somebody else? I've merged with a larger firm, but I yeah. still keep my own sort of little entrepreneurial place where I bring in my own clients and I help with theirs. And, and it's been an amazing mix of people that I've been able to work with. I've been able to work with people from, you know, politics and uh, digital media and uh, large brands. So it's been a great, it's been a great run and it's, it's going well. So I'm excited about it. And you're making film too, I understand. Uh, yes. Uh, I executive produced a documentary called I Am JFK Jr., which came out last summer, and I am working on another documentary, hopefully, called um, John McCain, American Hero, and looking to do, looks like in 2019, we are starting talks to do I Am Jackie Kennedy Onassis. Fantastic, but no plans to film the book yet. Not yet. We'll see. <laughs> you never know. The book is so wonderful, though, Rosie. I could see it so well as a film, you know. I mean, it made me laugh. It made me cry. It's just so vivid. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it should be made into a film. But for now... <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> for now, Rosemary Terenzia, I'd, I'd be up for that. That's a separate conversation. <laughs> but for now, Rosemary Terenzio. It really has been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for giving up your time. Thank you so much. And just to remind everyone why we're here, we're here for our dear friend, Vicki Sokol Evans, uh, who is the most life-changing Microsoft trainer you will ever meet in your life. She will change your life for the better. Please buy her book. Please download our webinar. Please support Vicki. That's why we're here. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Rosemary.